this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. Joining me for this episode is Robert Lyman, author of the excellent A War of Empires, Japan, India, Burma and Britain, 1941-45. The book covers the defeat of the British and Indian armies in 1941-42, the change of commanders, restructuring, training of the army and new tactics through to the extraordinary victories culminating in Mandalay in May 1945 and the collapse of all Japanese forces in Burma. But that is a big topic to cover, so I thought we would focus on the Battle of Kohima and to some extent in In 2013, a poll conducted by the British National Army Museum voted the battles of Kohima and in as Britain's greatest battle. Robert, thanks for joining me. Um, so before you get to the battles, do you want to start by setting the scene? Well, what I'll do is I'll just paint a picture, I think, Angus, and, and explain the strategic situation. So in 1942, the Japanese, of course, launched an invasion of Southeast Asia and they occupied Malaya, took Singapore, and they also invaded Burma and pushed the British out of Burma. They didn't think that they didn't intend to occupy the whole of Burma. All they really wanted to do when they attacked Burma was to capture Rangoon because Rangoon was the the port which supplied the Burma Road. And the Burma Road was the major strategic irritant to the Japanese. So they got um, Burma by default, actually. They got it because Britain hadn't prepared its defence and the Japanese had what I always describe as status advantage. So that's in a nutshell. By May 1942, the Japanese found themselves in occupation of a very large country uh, with with uh, only effectively two divisions at the time, so about 30,000 men. Quite an extraordinary story that we don't have time to go into today. One of the uh, consequences of the Japanese invasion of Burma is that they all of a sudden had a long frontier with India and they had a long frontier with China. China was their primary enemy, of course, you Listeners will know that the uh, Japanese have been fighting the Chinese since at least 1931 and in, in real actual military terms since 1937. That at the time was tying down, diff- numbers are difficult to determine, but between uh, three quarters of a million and a million men. So a very, very significant uh, war effort. The Japanese saw China as uh, the natural extension to their empire. If they're going to develop an empire China was where they would start. They'd, of course, begun in Korea in the 1880s, into Manchukuo uh, in the 90, early 1930s, and now China. So, so they've got a real problem. The J- Japanese have got a real problem with Burma. Whilst they're pretty comfortable with their strategic situation, they're also comfortable with their, their belief that they have defeated the British Empire. I just need to say at this stage, when, they, when, when I talk about the British, I also mean all those troops who fought as part of the British Empire, not least of all the Indian Army, and also during 1942, the Burma Army. Of course, they're all legally constituted armies of their respective country. They're not one single army. But let's just call it the British because it just makes it easier for people to understand. And the Japanese thought that they'd beaten the, the British. The British um, fought less well than the Chinese. That was a saying from uh, by General Mutaguchi Renya. He didn't have much time for the British. He thought that whenever you you launched a Banzai attack at the, the British, they would run away. Uh, and that was his experience of 1942. Quite a salutary experience on reflection when we realise how poorly prepared we as an empire were to fight a first-class enemy like the Japanese. But that um, experience hid a number of failures in the Japanese army. But I'll come to them in a moment, but they, they are pertinent as, as we go forward. But just think, the Japanese are in occupation in Burma. The British in 1940, late 1942 and early 1943 launched two operations of significance. One is in Arakan, which is along the Burmese littoral with the Bay of Bengal, which didn't go at all well. In fact, it went dismally badly for the British. It was badly conceived, very bad executed. Um, and significant casualties occurred as a result. And the Japanese, without a huge amount of effort, managed to push their defensive back out of Arakan 
into onto the border of, of India. That particular operation or series of operations ended by May 1940, uh, 1943, which was also the point at which another operation ended, which was the first Wingate operation, Operation Longcloth, into Burma, which began in February 1943. It was a long-range penetration um, patrol into Burma. Long-range penetration was a an accepted doctrine in the British Army and uh, hadn't really been used in any significant since um, the Boer War, although, of course, there were a number of punitive raids in the Northwest Frontier, of course, which followed the same model. So Wingate went off. We went charging into Burma uh, on Mongoloth with 3,000 men, and it didn't go very well. He lost 1,000 of those men. He came back. Uh, he made a number of mistakes, the most significant of which was actually crossing the Irrawaddy. So if your listeners think about Burma, it's in the upper part of Burma, it's divided in two parts, one by the Chinwin, but one by the Irrawaddy. Crossing the Chinwin is one thing, but if you cross the Irrawaddy again, you've got to recross it to come back, and that's difficult, particularly if the Japanese are between you and, and the Chinwin. And that's the problem that Wingate found himself in. Anyway, I'm, I, let's not get down into a rabbit war. And it's important to, to understand that that particular operation didn't go well when Wingate came back across the Chindwin in order to get to Imphal and finish the operation. He thought he'd be court-martialed for the loss of a third of his force. But he wasn't, and that's another story. But there we are. So it's 1943. But Wingate's operation got the Japanese thinking. They said, well, what we're seeing on our our western frontier uh, with India is a growing British military presence in Manipur. Manipur is the Indian princely state that abuts Burma. And the Japanese thought, well, we're going to have to do something about this. As the British increase their presence in Manipur, they're clearly preparing to do another, perhaps another big raid like Operation Longcloth, or maybe even to invade Burma. So throughout the end of 1943, the Japanese um, um denied about the possibility of launching a very significant raid into India. Without going into the details, if this was finally agreed, Mutaguchi Renya's 15th Army was given responsibility for it. The final plans that were approved by General Tojo in, in Tokyo were very significant. This is a very big operation. This is a, an operation of about 100,000 men, three very large Japanese fighting divisions moving into into Manipur and Assam to be able to to destroy whatever resources the British had in Manipur, to close the road that ran across the hills from the Brahmaputra Valley from Dimapur to Manipur. That particular road runs past or through a, a small Naga township called Kahima at the height of its um, of the hills of five and a half thousand feet. And by so doing, the Japanese thought they would remove the threat to their western frontier. And that was the plan. Mutaguchi Renya, who was given responsibility for it, though, had other ideas. Well, he accepted the plan, but from the beginning, he'd always argued that actually, instead of simply going into Manipur and capturing Kahima and cutting the road, what the Japanese should do is carry on a bit further and drop into the Brahmaputra Valley and capture Dimapur. Now, Dimapur is the town that sits at the bottom of the Naga Hills. It's the, it's the used to be known as Manipur Road because it's the road that runs into Manipur. And for many years, Manipur and Dimapur were inter interchangeable names. And he argued that if the Japanese got hold of Dimapur, it would do a number of very, very significant things. It would stop the uh, railway, close the railway running up to northern Assam where the American hump airlift was being managed from, and it would also uh, send a very significant signal to uh, nationalists in India that the Japanese were in the Brahmaputra Valley. They're in Assam. They're on the edge of Bengal. Bengal was the, or West Bengal was the most nationalist state in India. Mujiguchi thought it would do. It, it could actually topple the Raj. Now, there were a number of voices in Mutaguchi's ear. One of them was the Indian nationalist, Subhas Chandra Bose, who was saying much the same thing, that if you were to fall into the Brahmaputra Valley, knock on the door of Bengal, then there'd be an uprising against the Raj. And that part of the operation into India was propagandized as the march on Delhi, so the invasion of India. Now, Mutaguchi's plan was never endorsed by the Japanese high command, but actually 
there's an enormous amount of sense to Mutaguchi's arguments. And Mutaguchi didn't get away with what he wanted. Uh, but but actually, I think there's a very significant, there was a very significant chance that it would have succeeded, at least of seriously discombobulating the British. And my view is that if Mutaguchi had managed to fall into the Brahmaputra Valley and captured in Nepal, it would have been very, very difficult for there to have ever been a reconquest of Burma in 1945, because the one way in which you get resources, troops, equipment, all the rest of it, apart from air, into Manipur is along that road. So there we are. That's what we have. That's the plan. So by December 1943, the Japanese had agreed that they would launch this attack into Manipur and Assam. I always talk about Assam because Kahima is in Assam. It's not Manipur. But, you know, it's the same, same sort of area. So what we've got here is... um a Japanese plan, which the British actually, a few people in uh, on the British side know what's going to happen, Slim being one of them because of uh, his access to the version of Ultra that uh, the Allies were operating out of India. Very interesting story. And we knew the Japanese would be coming in March from high-level signal traffic. We didn't know a huge amount of detail about it, but sufficiently the Japanese would be crossing the Chinwin in some force. Now, so to go back to your original question, in 1944, what do we have? We have a very large invasion of India by General Mutaguchi's 15th Army in three major prongs, right up from the south, the southeast, and then from the east across the Chinwin in a significant force of the 31st a Japanese division commanded by General Sato aimed at capturing Kahima and cutting the road. To Manipur. Mutaguchi had given instructions to Sato, in fact, that when Kats, uh, Kahima had been captured, he was to send a regiment, the equivalent of a brigade, so about 3,000 men, down uh, a track called the Bokujan track, down into the, uh, the Brahmaputra Valley and to fall onto Manipur. And that regiment actually had begun its way down the Bokujan track before it was recalled. Um, we don't have time to go into that at the moment. So we've got in March, about the 7th or 8th of March, the first Japanese movements began against Imphal, way down in the south against a place called Tidham. But the major crossings began on about the 15th of March across the Chindwin, and uh, columns began moving in against the primary uh, defensive positions uh, held, in this case, by the 20th Indian Division, a place called Mora and Tamu, and um, on the U River. and unknown to the British, a very significant force, this 31st Japanese division was making its way to Kahima. So this is quite an extraordinary um, force. General Sato, the whole division is going, the, the division set off at about 20,000 men. Uh, on its way to Kahima, it was sidetracked by three separate actions, the first of which was an action at a place called Sang Shag which it shouldn't really have got itself involved in. In fact, there is an argument that says that they should have left it to another Japanese division, the 15th division. But look, the, 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 the there is an argument. Well, actually, let me just talk through the argument. The argument that most historians have, have used when they look at Sang Shak is that this detracted Sato from his primary objective, which was securing Kahima, and that if he had ignored Sang Shak, he would have got to Kahima very quickly, and Kahima at the time was undefended. The listeners need to know that actually Kahima wasn't defended. It was a rest station on the road to Manipur. It had lots of storage depots. It had fuel and equipment depots for looking after vehicles on that long 140-mile journey into Manipur and back. And um, no thought was given to its defence because, or very little thought had been given to its defence because no one had thought that it was at risk. <laughs> Slim and General Montague Stopford, who's the commander of the 33rd Corps, when they evaluate and ranking who commanded the line of communication, the line of communication from Dimapur into Manipur was the most strategic aspect of the fighting and, and it had a separate major general, General Ranking, who was responsible for it, which it gives you a, 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 a unique uh, perspective, it gives us a unique perspective on what the fighting in the Far East was all about. It was about geography and, and logistics. Anyway, Kahima, this point's important. When Slim and Ranking and Stopford all looked at the area, they all said, well, the obvious strategic target is Dimapur. If the Japanese are going to cross the hills, they're going to fall in Dimapur. So we need to think about defending that. Ultimately, they didn't, but let's not defend Kahima. 
And um, the troops in Kohima, when news of the Japanese advance began, were actually withdrawn back down to Dimapur, not long. So Kohima was, you know, at the end of March, early April 1941, uh, 1944 rather, was a, a, a effectively undefended. There were a number of troops there, about a thousand uh, troops around Kohima, but they were rear echelon troops, storesmen and people. They weren't, most of them weren't fighting troops somewhere, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Anyway, so we go back to Sangshak. Japanese advance through the hills in a number of columns. The southern column is held up at Sangshak for about four days and loses a considerable number of soldiers, perhaps as many as a thousand, in a very, very fierce battle against a very raw Green two battalion uh, Indian parachute brigade one five two Indian parachute brigade in quite an extraordinary action in which large numbers of Japanese became casualties and this was a sort of fighting the Japanese hadn't really expected as I said earlier the Japanese view of the the British and the Indian soldiers they had they had encountered in 1942 was that they were easier to defeat than the Jap than the Chinese easier than the Chinese was Mutaguchi's phrase. But here at Sangshak, we have Indian troops, young Gurkha troops, fighting back with a ferocity the Japanese had not encountered before. So leap forward a few days, we have, once Sangshak was behind them, Sartre kept on pressing on towards um, Kohima, and he was held up, much to his surprise, one of his, his northern column, uh, and the middle column were then held up, much to his surprise, uh, by defenders at two Naga villages, one called Karasom and the other called Jessamy. And these were troops of the Assam Regiment. Now, the Assam Regiment had only been raised in 1941, it had two battalions, one battalion of which, this is the first battalion, was the primary fighting component of the regiment. They had spent 1942 and 43 in the northern Brahmaputra Valley looking after protecting the American airfields. With the uh, threat of the Japanese invasion, they were brought back down to Dimapur and then sent up to Kahima. And the interesting thing about the Assam Regiment only being raised in 1941 is that they were raised from the hills. So for the first time, large numbers of Naga and Kazi and Assamese men had joined the Indian Army in an Indian regiment in their own territory, the Assam Regiment. Very famous. Not to be confused, I'm just going to mention this now, not to be confused with the Assam Rifles. Assam Rifles were a paramilitary force. They had been established in the late 19th century they largely recruited from Gurkha families domiciled in the hills. But and they fought a very significant, played a very significant role in the battle. But let's just focus on the Assam Regiment. So we've heard about Sang Shak. All of a sudden at Karasom and Jessamy, the men of the Assam rifles, so they'd never seen battle before. They had, they were new to the army. They were Naga and Ka Kazi, Kazi name of the hills around Shalom. And Assamese men fought ferociously under their British officers and uh, caused a very the Japanese have a very bloody nose. They then withdrew in very good order to Kohima, withdrawing to Kohima on the afternoon of the 3rd of April. So all of a sudden, Sato's 20,000 men has been hit by quite uh, effective defenders in three locations. It wasn't the easy advance that Sato had expected, and it meant that when the Japanese began arriving at Kohima, this small road stop on the on the, the journey between Dimapur and, and uh, Imphal, the capital of Manipur, on the afternoon of the 4th of April 1944, they ended up coming in dribs and drabs. And in fact, the first Japanese to be killed at Kohima on the afternoon of the 4th of April 1944 were Japanese troops coming up warily uh, along the road from the battle at Sang Shak and, in fact, at, um, at Karasong. And they were on the road, and they were killed in an ambush by men of the Shia Regiment. Now, the Shia Regiment is interesting because they weren't part of the Indian Army. It was a Nepalese battalion. The Nepalese government, the government of the Kingdom of Nepal, gifted, I think, 14 or 15 or 16 major units to the Indian Army, even though Nepal was neutral during the war, to fight the Japanese, which is quite extraordinary. And there was there were two companies of the Shia Regiment in Kohima, and the first Japanese soldiers of uh, the Battle of Kohima were killed by Nepalese soldiers, which is quite an extraordinary fact, I think. So you then have this Japanese division not coming up in a, a major body against Kohima, but coming in dribs and drabs. And I'm always reminded when I think about the Japanese approach to Kohima, 
of Rommel saying, uh, boot them, don't spatter them. If you're going to hit the enemy, hit them with concentrated force at a decisive point. And Sato didn't do this. And as a consequence of that, it allowed the British to suddenly realise that actually Kahima was undefended and needed defending, and it enabled them to, to bring troops up from Dimapur very quickly. And for a an ad hoc defence to be created around the, the ridge. Now, I just need to give you your listeners a little bit of a background to the the geography of Kahima, because there are two major pieces of land that we'll end up talking about. Let's just say we're looking at it from the Indian side. We're looking uh, east towards the Burmese border, which is another 100 miles further on. We're looking at Kahima. We're looking at it from Dimapur. We're looking up into the hills. On the right-hand side, as you look at it, is a Mount Pulabadze. And on the left-hand side, as you look at it, and Pulabad is about 7,000 feet, and the left-hand side, as you look at it, is Naga Hill. And in the middle, just down the major um, ridge from Mount Pulabadze, is the Kahima Ridge. And it's got lots of names, and we'll talk about them in a moment. But think about it as the ridge. It's a ridge with lots of names, including some of House Hill and Garrison Hill. But it's the Kahima Ridge. And it's the ridge around which the road between Dimapur and Manipur loops. So as we're coming up into the ridge, it goes around the left and the other side of the ridge and then drops down through the hills towards Song and to Imphal. Now, the ridge is where the British decided that they would defend uh, against the Japanese. They gave up defending the hill, uh, Naga Hill on the left-hand side, because they didn't have enough troops. So on the 4th of April 1944, when it was realized the Japanese were were concentrating their forces around Imphal, the garrison commander at Hima decided that he would defend a ridge and he deployed his troops accordingly. And he did an incredibly good job of it, in fact, because this was the point at which the subsequent siege of Kahima was fought between the 4th of April through to about the 20th of April. The very, very significant siege, a very significant battle in world history that stopped the Japanese from penetrating further into India and achieving their goal, if indeed goal it was, to capture Dimapur. But also it was the siege that enabled the British to reorganise and to bring in the 2nd British Division to then clear the Japanese out of Kahima and fight the Battle of Kahima, which went on from about the 20th of April through to the 3rd of June. So it's best to think about Kahima as two integrated but separate actions. The siege between the 4th and the, 20th and the 20th of April and the battle that then went on to uh, to remove the Japanese until about the 2nd or 3rd of June when it was formally concluded. Now, the siege was, was very interesting, interesting because I mentioned those troops that had been sent down to Dimapur. They were the, the 4th Battalion of the Royal West Kents, known as in the British Army as the Dirty Half Hundred. They're about just short of 450 men who had originally come up to Kahima to defend it and then had been sent down to Dimapur because, as I said, Slim, Rankin and Stopford thought Dimapur was the point where the Japanese would be aiming for. When it was realised that they'd made a mistake, the Dirty Half Hundred were rushed back into Kahima under enemy fire, in fact, on the 4th. And when they got back onto Kahima Ridge on the afternoon of the 4th, the Japanese had occupied Naga Hill on the left-hand side. It's about a mile and a half away. It dominates uh, the ground visually, uh, although you, need, you clearly need long-range um, guns in order to be able to, to fire across it. But the Japanese could see what the British were doing because the road was in full view of the Japanese from Naga Hill coming up the valley to the, the ridge. And throughout the, battle, throughout the battle, rather, the entire ridge was overseen by the Japanese on Naga Hill. And when you go to Kahima today, the first place I encourage people to go is is uh, the top of Naga village, where you can stand. Actually, there's a water tower on the top, climb to the top of the water tower, and you have a magnificent view over the ridge. Yeah. On the other side of the valley, you can see the whole battlefield just laid out in front of you. The battlefield that we're going to talk about now is, of course, where the current cemetery is. So we have the raw, the raw West Kents, uh, the dirty half hundred, back uh, on the ridge on the afternoon of the 4th, thankfully, digging like mad under enemy fire and creating a defensive perimeter. Now, the top end, the Pulabadzi end of the um, Hema Ridge is a hill called Jail Hill, so-called because there's a jail at the base of it. 
And, and between the 4th and the 6th of April, the Japanese occupied Jail Hill, push off the defenders of Jail Hill. There was a, um, a company of the Assam rifles on the um, Jail Hill. And the perimeter was really established for the first time around the ridge. Now, let's just talk about the troops there. There were about 2,000 or 2,500 troops on the ridge itself in the defensive area, but only about 1,500 of them were trained soldiers trained to uh, fire weapons and and fight. So we had about a 1,000 what uh, euphemistically called useless mouths. So these are people it captured, caught in the, in, the, in the siege area, unable to get out, and who need to be protected. So they started digging in like mad. Quite a number of them became casualties throughout the siege through artillery fire and so on. And they became a little bit of a problem because you had to feed and, and look after them as well. The garrison commander, quite a remarkable man, had actually, in those days, the few days that he had before the Japanese arrived, prepared enough ammunition and food in the siege area to last the duration of the siege. In fact, if he hadn't done that, the siege wouldn't have been a success, wouldn't have been successful. The only thing they didn't have was water, but they were able to get access to water, small amounts of water outside the perimeter uh, at night. But water was a real problem throughout the siege. Let's just go back to the numbers. So we've got 1,500 men who know how to shoot their rifles. Who are they? Well, we have got 450 men of the Royal West Kents. They had their tails up. They had defeated the Japanese in their uh, encounter battles at Sinswe, the Battle of the Box, a few months before. And uh, they were good soldiers. They were well-led, well-equipped, and um, they performed very, very well. But one of the great myths of the battle, maybe it's not a myth, it's a misconception, or it's something we just don't think about in this country, is, well, who were the other thousand? Who were the other two-thirds of the people fighting the, the siege of Kahima? Well, they were Indian soldiers. They were Indian soldiers of the Assam Regiment and the Assam Rifles. So that's the first thing we need to be really clear about. It was a, an imperial battle. It was fought by British and Indian soldiers the majority of whom were Indian. And the great travesty for me as a historian is to recognize that many of the Indian voices who fought in the battle in the battle have been lost. And I mean, I've interviewed an, quite a number of veterans over the years, not many Indian veterans of the battle. In fact, I've probably interviewed more Japanese veterans of the Battle of Kohima than I have Indian, which is, a, which is, a, which is really sad. But we need to remember that it's a really fundamental, important uh, point of, of importance here when you consider the battle. And wh why is it important? In, is it important? To, it's important, first of all, in terms of numbers. It's also important in terms of the fact that this was the army, the Indian army, that the Japanese had defeated in 1942 and thought that they were weak and, and wouldn't ever be able to um, defeat them in battle. And the, there's a little bit of a side story here that uh, your listeners will need to understand, which is actually the transformation that had taken place in the Indian Army through 1942, late 1942 and early 1943. Well, I was going to say, how much of that is down to slim? Well, a very, very large amount down to slim. Uh, and, and an extraordinary man who uh, had commanded the uh, Burma Corps through the retreat in 1942, he landed in March 1942 and carried it through, realised when he bought his... Burma Corps back across the Chinwin into Tamu and then in Imphal in May 1942, that the Japanese were beatable. He just didn't have the resources at the time. The Japanese, as I said, definitely had staff's advantage. You know, there is this idea that the Japanese were a supreme and sublime military engine who could uh, defeat anything that came across them. It's not true, I'm afraid. It's uh, They had staff's advantage. They had an advantage against the British who hadn't prepared for the defense of Burma. But it was quite clear the Japanese, you know, really struggled against the Soviet army in 1939 and um, didn't have the martial prowess, as one might put it, that, that, they've, that they've been given by virtue of the fact that Japanese soldiers fought ferociously uh, as, a, as individuals. And we, we know about the cult of Bushido, this um, spiritual dimension to the art of soldiering, the, the Japanese art of soldiering which was very important to them. But actually that hid uh, a multitude of failings that became very, very obvious during the 
Operation Ugo, Operation C, which is this invasion of India. And I'll talk through some of them. But Slim, yes, Slim was largely responsible with Orkin Lake, who had now in June 1943 become the commander in chief of the Indian Army again. Wavell, had, who had been the commander in chief, had gone on to be viceroy. Very good viceroy, in my view. Um, but Orkin Lake and Slim, between them, rebuilt the Indian Army, uh, restructured it, um, did an enormous amount to retrain and prepare the Indian Army and build up the dramatic logistical challenges facing anyone who wanted to fight in these these hills. And I, I, it's worth just going into another little side conversation to explain the, the challenge of geography here, because it really was significant. So this battle in Kahima was at the end of a long line of communication for the 14th Army that ran back to Calcutta, another uh, 800 miles away. Now, this part of India, eastern India, was very poorly served with any form of transport infrastructure. There was only one road, as I mentioned, going from Dimapur to um, Manipur. Uh, in order to get to Dimapur itself from Calcutta, you had to go up either the Brahmaputra uh, River, a journey that took about three weeks. Actually, most of the vessels, the river traffic vessels, had been removed in 1942, 1941-42 to go and support the Indian Army actually in the Middle East. So there were many of the ferries and boats that would normally populate the river were gone. You had a road that uh, went up north from Calcutta and then uh, moved further east to Guwahati across the Brahmaputra. There was no bridge over the Brahmaputra. You had to cross on ferry. There was also a railway that went up from Calcutta all the way to Guwahati. So it's 800 miles. For listeners in the UK, that's a affecting the distance between London and Prague. And, and I you know, remind people that fighting in Kahima and then in Imphal was effectively fighting in Prague from your base in London with one of the world's greatest rivers between you. So it's very, very hard to actually manage it. Uh, one of the reasons why the effort was improved or made less difficult in 1944 was the advent of large numbers of transport aircraft, many of them American, but some also British. The primary transport variant being the C-47 or in British service, the DC-3, the Dakota, which was the workhorse of the campaign. Without the DC-3, uh, none of the operations in uh, the Far East could have been achieved. The, the 4th Battalion of the Royal West Kent, in fact, had been flown into a brand new airfield built in 1942 at Dimapur. It's the same airport you fly into today when you visit Kahima. The Royal West Kents were flown in directly from the battlefield in Arakan as part of the arriving 161 Brigade. So it's quite extraordinary. When Slim realised the scale of the Japanese effort against him in Imphal and Kahima, he moved two whole divisions, the 7th Indian and the 5th Indian, by aircraft directly from the battlefield in Arakan to Dimapur and to Imphal. Really quite dramatic. And he was able to do it in a couple of afternoons. I'm exaggerating slightly, but it's, it's really, really quite extraordinary to see how, you know, what strategic flexibility was provided to Slim by his access to these aircraft. Of course, very few of these people, Indian soldiers and British soldiers, had ever flown in an aircraft before. And here they were in full kit, being loaded up into, into a C 47s, flown across the hills. And I've flown across those hills uh, a number of times. And the last thing you want to do is be in a DC 3. It's, you know, not, not, not a fantastic journey. And they went from one battlefield to another. So Slim had those sort of advantages. But he also had soldiers by 1944 who were well trained, they were well equipped, they were prepared to fight the Japanese in a way that perhaps in the past they'd felt incapable of doing. But the other thing to remind your listeners, uh, when we're thinking about how difficult it is to fight in these hills a long way from Calcutta and at the end of a very long, crazy line of communication, is the weather. Because in this part of the world, the monsoon, which drops about 300 inches a year, uh, give or take a couple of hundred, because if you're in the Kazi Hills, which is the wettest part of the world, they have recorded 500 inches of, of rain around Shillong. Um, so let's just say 300. Well, compare that with the UK, where we get about 35 inches a year. We whinge like mad about the rainfall. But actually, this rainfall, most of the rain in the Far East, of course, uh, falls during the monsoon period. Not all of it, but most of it. So from uh, the end of April, early May, every year through to October, you've got five months of rain. And it's rain like, if you have an experience, you've never, ever experienced before, not certainly not a European. So you have to fight in this. You have to fight at the end of a very long line of communication in these hills under a downpour, a nonstop downpour. 
Now, it's not particularly warm in the hills, so it's 5,500 feet up at Kahima, uh, but you've got all the it, – it's very heavily forested or uh, covered in foliage and jungle. It's, it's not hot jungle, but it's still uncomfortable, and it's very, very wet. So you've got all these amazing challenges that you have to overcome, keeping people dry, keeping your, your ammunition, your uh, weapons dry, locating – positions for artillery for airdrops and all the rest of it with all this rain and fog and you've got the japanese so it really is quite a considerable challenge so here we are just just rush back to the 4th and 5th of april 1944 we have the rains hadn't yet started but we have 1500 men 1500 fighting men another thousand sitting in their trenches cowering because they don't have weapons and they've no way of countering the japanese being gradually uh, surrounded by about 15,000 men of Sato's 31st Division. Sato had decided that he was going to capture Kahima and fight for it, and he did so. And over the period of the next three weeks, the Japanese were able to attack from both the north, so the, the left-hand side of the ridge and the top of the ridge as well, and draw the, the, uh, the besiegers down to a small area the locus for which was the famous tennis court. And the tennis court was built for the uh, deputy commissioner of the hill tribes in Nagaland, a man called Charles Pawsey, just above his house. He had a nice bungalow. For those of you who have been to Kahima or have seen photographs of it, it's basically the, the length of the current cemetery. The northern end of the cemetery is at the traffic control point where the road is, and you walk up the cemetery in the high point is the tennis court where the cross of sacrifice currently is. So that's effectively the, the besieged area. That's the area where the final remaining 1,500 men of the of the defenders fought the Japanese to prevent them getting into India. So that's the siege. It's really quite an extraordinary story. The, the question is, how on earth could the men continue fighting? Well, the first airdrops were made to them on the 13th. So they've been fighting for a week before airdrops uh, arrived. Uh, those airdrops were actually launched by uh, aircraft to the United States Army Air Force, and they all missed. And a large, large amount of mortar ammunition, three-inch mortar ammunition, fell to the Japanese. And within an hour or two, the Japanese were using that ammunition against the defenders. So it didn't go particularly well. But the, the men hung on. They fought ferociously. It was a hand-to-hand -hand battle uh, for days and nights. And the Japanese launched increasingly ferocious attempts to, to, to wipe out the defenders. And it got to a point, there's a fantastic museum in Kahima, actually. It's just, just on the road out of uh, Kahima, on the road to Imphal, where a diorama, it was made in Britain, but um, sent out to in India, describes the battle. And it's quite extraordinary because it does demonstrate very well just how uh, intermixed all the defensive positions were. You have this idea of the Western Front where the Germans are on one side and the British are on the other. In Kahima, the posts were sort of mixed. There were some trenches that were occupied by the Japanese. On the other side, there were trenches occupied by British and Indian soldiers and vice versa. It was a bit of a hodgepodge. Let me just say that by this time, the British 2nd Division had been rushed across from Pune, where it had been based near uh, south of Bombay, uh, 2,000 miles by train. They were originally going to go down to fight in Arakan, but they were diverted by Slim to Dimapur. They made their way to Dimapur. They started arriving uh, in the early days of April 1944, but the division wasn't complete until the 11th. And they made their way up into the hills and were in a position. The first encounter with the Japanese was on the 14th, and they began to relieve the besiegers, the first Troops of the British Division, the Berkshire Regiment, ended up on the hill on the 18th of April. And by the 20th of April, most of the besiegers had managed to be evacuated down the road under Japanese fire from Naga Hill and taken down to Dimapur. And the British 2nd Division were on the hill, men of the, the 6th British Infantry Brigade, men like the Dorsets and, and the Berkshires. And they spent the, the next uh, several weeks fighting to remove the Japanese from the ridge. So although the siege had ended on the on the ridge itself, the battle proper began. And the battle actually went on for the rest of April and the whole of May. So we're talking about another six weeks of battle. So it's, it's always useful just to get your head around the fact that actually Kahima was two battles, the siege and then the battle itself. And the story of the 
the tennis court itself is that actually it wasn't until the end of May that the Japanese were finally extricated from the tennis court itself, and they were finally extricated uh, by the use of tanks. Tanks were winched up onto the northern side of the ridge under Japanese fire and uh, managed to, the first tank under a command of a man called Sergeant Waterhouse managed to plonk itself on the top side of the of the tennis court and with its gun blast the Japanese out of the trenches. One of the features of the Japanese is that in the offensive, they were very, very tough and tenacious. They were equally tough and tenacious in defense. They would burrow down and they would camouflage their their trenches. And their trench positions were all interlocking, so each one trench would support another. Many trenches, in fact, only had one or two troops in them, but they would support each other. So, uh, you know, if, an, if a neighboring trench was attacked, then they would they would support it with fire. And they were very, very hard to eradicate. In fact, in Burma, Indian Burma, the British very quickly discovered that the only way really to defeat or destroy a Japanese trench was by using artillery fire to expose it, to remove the foliage from above it. Um, Japanese trenches were always heavily covered with logs and overhead cover and then camouflaged so you wouldn't actually be able to spot them. But artillery, high explosive would remove the foliage and then the, the trench itself would be defeated by direct sniping by tanks. But by 1944, by May 1944, that was the only way the, the Japanese bunkers were, were cleared. There were other fierce battles uh, developing uh, at the, well, uh, occurring at the same time in Imphal. And it's important that we, you know, we see Imphal and Kahima as the, the same battle. They're just two different geographies in the same battle because Sato's division was one of the three d- divisions uh, employed by General Mutaguchi to defeat the British in Imphal. Kahima was just a waypoint on the, on, on the road. It's important really just to see them as, as, as the same fight. Whilst I'm talking about this battle at Kahima, the same long fight was being undertaken at Imphal. Too long, of course, for this, this uh, podcast today. That may, maybe that's an opportunity to, to come back and talk about Imphal because it's really quite an extraordinary story. I think it's really important to understand that whilst the Japanese were uh, tenacious, they didn't want to move, it's important really to understand that actually they were fighting a losing battle. Once the second division turned up, the battle would only actually go one way. Despite the fact that it was very hard, the rain by this time was coming down. It was very hard to identify where the Japanese trenches were. They would fight the last man. I mean, uh, Slim mentions this repeatedly. He said, you know, all armies talk about fighting to the last man. In his experience, there's only one army in the world that only that ever did it, and that was the Japanese. So you had to eliminate the second division and also the seventh Indian division. I mustn't forget the seventh had to eliminate every second, every single Japanese from their positions around Infal before the battle could actually be considered won. And that was the long attritional slog. I mean, it's very interesting. Um, General Montague Stopford, who was the general officer commanding the 33rd Corps, which included the 2nd Division, 2nd British Division, and the 7th Indian Division, had last fought a battle of this kind, he said, at Passchendaele in 1917. By the end of the battle, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, the, uh, the photographs are really amazing. The entire forested cover around Kahima had disappeared. The ridge itself was covered in the remains of the supply parachutes that had come in during the siege. And um, but artillery fire, both British and Japanese, had completely removed all the foliage cover uh, around the area. And when Montague Stopford first saw it, he was absolutely shocked at, its, um, at the images that it that reminded him of. A very, very small area of ground in a remote part of India on the major route into Imphal, so strategically important, fought over by the armies of two great empires, fought over by men to the death. Very large numbers of Japanese were killed. The The point about the Japanese that is that they just fought on to the end. A side story to the Japanese command here that's interesting. The Japanese advanced in March on their objectives in uh, Assam and Manipur, carrying all their logistics with them, their food and ammunition, and were assuming that they would achieve all these objectives within three weeks, and no resupply of any significance had been considered. Mutaguchi was concerned that he, well, he believed that he'd be able to 
achieve all his objectives within that period of time. The problem is, as soon as the 21 days came, the Japanese were running out of food and ammunition. They used what they called Churchill supplies. So whenever they captured British supplies, they would reuse them against their erstwhile owners. They, know, they, knew, they called them Churchill supplies. Thank you very much, Mr. Churchill. Uh, they also used or lived off the land. So they... They brought with them herds of cattle, didn't they? Herds of b- 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 buffaloes and goats and... The real challenge that Mojiguchi had was that um, how do you actually take all your supplies with you? So forget about a, a long tail. How do you actually take your your supplies with you if you're not? You either get your soldiers to carry them. Well, they have to take themselves over 100 miles of really, really hilly terrain. It's hard. So they tried elephants and they tried oxen. The problem is oxen. If oxen have been trained to plow, they don't. they're not trained to walk. There are cattle that are trained to walk. Anyway, the oxen that they took in with them uh, didn't go very far, and most of them ended up as barbecue. The real challenge is that by the time Sato's 20, uh, 31st Division had got to Imfa, uh, sorry, had got to Kahima, all their equipment was carried by them. And so there's a long battle between Sato and Mutaguchi demanding more supplies. Sato sending off uh, increasingly aggressive and angry signals to Mutaguchi demanding that he be resupplied properly, otherwise he wouldn't be able to hold in Kahima. And throughout the entire entirety of the, the battle, in fact, Sato's narrative and the narrative that's come down to us is that Sato did everything he could to prevail at Kahima, but he was let down by Mutaguchi's failure of logistics. And there are many people who argue that today. I don't think it's true because Sato knew very well that he had to achieve the objective without a significant logistics chain. And indeed, there is a very strong argument, which I hold to, that says that if Sato had ignored Kahima and just carried on down to Dimapur, he would have avoided a fight altogether. It's a very important argument. But the the point here, I think, is that Mujiguchi and Sato had never liked each other. They fell out spectacularly during the battle. This was also the case with Yamauchi and Yanagida, the two other Japanese divisional commanders, who didn't have a good relationship with Mujiguchi. And the failure of Japanese command relationships is a very important aspect in the overall failure of the Japanese in this campaign. But I think the point that it needs to be emphasized again is this reality that Sato fought on to the death and he he didn't want to give up because giving up is not something Japanese commanders ever want to do. Their, Their aim is victory. And it's important to understand that when Japanese soldiers joined the army, their primary duty was not simply to be obedient, not simply to do what the army commander asked or demanded, but to die for the emperor. And unfortunately, I think that you know the Japanese Japanese generals in the Second World War were particularly good at killing. They were particularly good at killing their own soldiers. In fact, they killed more of their own soldiers than they killed of the enemy. The, the entire numbers of... Uh, killed and wounded in the, um, in the Burma campaign. And we call it the Burma campaign because the whole war was about Burma, even though, of course, much of the campaign in forty four was actually in India, is really important to understand. The entire campaign cost about 14,000 allied casualties, of whom about 5,000 were, were British, so many more Indian. But the Japanese suffered probably eighty or 90,000 casualties. This is 1944 and forty five. So four times as many casualties suffered by the Japanese because of the the failings of their commanders and this ridiculous obsession with with death and and honouring the uh, the emperor. So we get to the end of the battle. Sato gets to a point where he he says his men have got no ammunition and they're eating grass and a withdrawal is ordered. Despite Motoguchi's instructions, he withdraws his troops in early June 1944 and begins a evacuation over the hills back to the Chindwin in a in an operation the Japanese have sub- subsequently called the Road of Bones. Large numbers of Japanese died of starvation en route, and it's very hard to tie down uh, any numbers here, but we know that no guns got back over the Chindwin and a very small number of men. But basically, the entirety of Mutaguchi's army of 100,000 was destroyed. And the Road of Bones is the, the, the title that Fergal Keane gave to his excellent book on the battle. In fact, Fergal's book is about the siege primarily, not, not the battle. But the Road of Bones, 
uh, really is a very good descriptor of the Japanese failure. It's very interesting, actually, Fogel um, takes the view that Sato did a great job in, in fighting and recovering his army in the teeth of the ignorance of Mutaguchi and the, 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 the fact that the Mutaguchi's uh, 15th Army didn't establish adequate logistical resupply. And that's that's fair enough. I take a slightly different view, which is that Sato knew all the way along that he had to achieve victory without logistical resupply, and he should have thought through more strategically the uh, the chance of going down to Dimapur, which Mutaguchi had pressed on him. And actually, his ego, his hatred of Mutaguchi, prevented him from acknowledging that Mutaguchi's judgment in this case was correct. And, and I think that's right. Mutaguchi had made the right call, and Sato disobeyed him. So Sato and Mutaguchi, interestingly enough, both survived the war and, um, and carried, carried on this battle in, into, their, um, into their, their dotage, actually. But there we are. That, that's a very quick introduction to quite an extraordinary uh, story. Um, one of the most influential battles of the war, and I, I, I do hold to this, it was a very strategic battle, even though the numbers weren't of, of anything of the size of Stalingrad or anything like that, it was a dramatic turning point because it was the point at which the Japanese invasion of India, the Japanese drive into India was stopped. Even more than that, it was the point at which the Japanese were defeated. And this is the really critical point because the the Japanese defeat of Kohima in Imphal was actually the key that enabled Slim to continue behind them, push them out of Burma, across the Chinwen, and open up the reconquest of Burma. In 1944, there was no concept that the that Burma could be re, um, reconquered. Uh, it wasn't part of Allied strategy. It happened by accident, and that accident was initiated by the Japanese defeated at Kohima and Imphal. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with you in a moment. Welcome back. I'm talking to Rob Lyman about the Battle of Kohima. It's also proof of Slim's training where he's saying to people, if you're surrounded, don't worry, we'll get you out. Uh, we can re- we can resupply you by air. It's almost, it makes me mindful that Chesty Puller kind of quote, you know, when we're surrounded, I can't remember, when we're surrounded, we've got them where we want them. It, it, well, that's it, exactly right. And in fact, that, that particular quote was used by, by Slim. Slim said, look, when you're surrounded, we've got an anchor, he called it a hammer and anvil. You, you're the anvil against which the hammer of the, uh, counterattacking forces will fall, and the Japanese are caught between. And he was absolutely right. That first was taught at the Battle of the Box in Zwea a few months before in February 1944, uh, admirably described by James Holland in his book, Bama 44. Very, very important battle. Uh, that battle itself was, that uh, attack, uh, Operation Hago, was a uh, a feint. The Japanese launched a feint in Arakan in order to draw off Slim's troops from the um, from the, the major point of battle in Imphal and Kohima. But it, it does point to the fact that actually it doesn't matter whether if you've got the right idea, the box will work, but you actually need soldiers who are well-trained and capable enough to withstand the physical and psychological realities of being surrounded. And if you're not trained enough, if you don't really understand what's happening, you you will be scared and you will fall victim to your fears. And and that's what had happened in the past. But if soldiers knew that they would be surrounded by the Japanese, because that was the Japanese tactic, all they need to do is to stand firm, they'd be resupplied by air, and all they need to do is then not just defend against the Japanese attacking against them, but to ag- aggressively counterattack from their anvil, they could defeat the Japanese, because it meant that the Japanese weren't concentrated. And that's a very important point. If you are a Japanese army and you're trying to surround a defended box, you're not concentrated at any one point. You can be you can be counted at any number of points. And that was the great strength of the box concept. Of course, the box goes back, the idea of the box goes back to early human history. And, and we've got some great examples of them. In the late Victorian era of the the, the box has been quite effective. In fact, uh, the Battle of Waterloo, former square, what former square? Same same sort of concept, but the, the point stands. You need confidence. You need the air power as well to be able to drop supplies in to those who are in the box, and you need you just need the calmness and confidence to stick it out. And that was really what the British were able to do at Sinsweya in. February 1944, 
in the battles in Fala Gehima, yes, the, the same thing stood, but of course it was much more difficult because the monsoon was then falling. Yeah. Monsoon meant that air transport was much more limited. Whenever opportunities came to drop supplies, of course, they did. I think the really important thing about the Imphal pocket, as it's called, is that the British were able to keep on flying uh, supplies in during the siege. It's called Operation Stamina. And they were also able to fly out on the exiting aircraft large numbers of so-called useless mouths, something that couldn't happen at Kahima during the siege, but definitely did during the... um, during Imphal. Well, Imphal's a different scale, isn't it? That you, you, it's huge. Yes, but it's it's, it's Imphal. It's very it's very similar to Kahima because in October 1944, so after the battle, just before Stopford and uh, Christensen and Schoons and Slim were all knighted, I think it's the eighth of October 1944 by General Wavell, the Viceroy, on behalf of King George the Sixth. Wavell came out and had a bit of a battlefield tour led by Slim. And Wavell said, I don't really understand this battle. It seems a battle fought in penny packets. And it's absolutely right because you had Kahima in the top and you had a number of other separate battles. They were all separately engaged around the Imphal Plain by the individual brigades and divisions um, engaged in combat. So it, it, it's a different, it was a different sort of battle, unusual. And th- there's no doubt that the Japanese were unable to make the battle their own in a way that they wanted. And partly that was their problem. So if you think about, I've always been really quite struck about um, the Japanese inability to see beyond Kahima. But likewise, the Shenam Saddle, which occupies the high ground on the road between Imphal and Tamu over the hills going down to Jinwen, the Japanese hung on there for six weeks, fighting desperately to get access to the road. Whereas if I was commanding the Japanese army at the time uh, there, I would have withdrawn and sent my troops through the hills into Imphal itself. Because once you captured one of those airfields, what there are six main airfields in um, Imphal, two very significant, Tullyhull, which is the main airfield now for Manipur, and the other is Imphal, Maine. You, you could have stopped the um, defence of Imphal at a stroke, in my view, because you would, the, the British wouldn't have been able to resupply themselves. Instead, they fought. This is because the Japanese had this concept of battle. You know, war is won by battle. Whereas Sun Tzu said, actually, war is not won by battle. War is won by securing victory. And there are lots of ways of achieving victory. Battle might be won, but you might be able to achieve victory by doing something different, by uh, undertaking some strategic move, maneuver, by moving behind and, and uh, securing a, a key city or town or a road, which means that the enemy surrenders because there's no point in fighting. The Japanese attitude was victory is achieved by battle, a significant strategic failing, a significant conceptual failing, which um, they never fully understood. Well, did they? understand air transport like as an integral part so was it even part of their thinking at which point why would you go for the airport if, if it's not even part of your establishment why would you think about it being somebody else's if battle is the the way in which you think of war and battle is the way in which you win then yes they wouldn't have gone against uh, they wouldn't have gone against the airfields but it, it's it's an illogical methodology because when they were sitting in the hills they could see hundreds of aircraft flying in every day in and out of the airfields and and um the, the well certainly the two main ones the c-47 airfields and they could see the power that this was giving to their enemy and yet they did nothing about it there was one attack against palal airfield which is a fighter base on the edge of the infall plane that was actually interestingly enough carried out by men of the um, indian national army not by the japanese army it it does indicate a limited thinking about the way in which you use military force. Slim had a view that said, I'm not going to spend, I don't want to spend my valuable military resources fighting where the enemy is strongest. I want to fight him where he is weakest, where he's most vulnerable. And it goes back to that question, if you're fighting an enemy tank, what's the best way of destroying a tank? Well, most military thinking over time would have said, well, we need a big gun. I need to be able to get through the armor. I need to, to do that sort of stuff. And that's developed anti-armor anti, uh, um, uh, anti armor 
technology. But another view is to say, well, actually, the way we destroy a tank is by killing its fuel bells and making it unable to operate. And Slim's approach was more the fuel bells approach. And it was partly because of the circumstances upon which he was forced. We need to remember right throughout all of this, the Japanese always deployed more numbers of troops than the, than the Allies and in Burma, fighting troops, that is. But it was also developed as a consequence of his military thinking. He didn't see the point in fighting by battle. Battle is not a, a swordsman's engagement. It's not you know, The war is not won because one swordsman can prevail against another swordsman. And this this Japanese idea came from the deeply rooted chivalric traditions and the samurai tradition that actually made no sense in modern war. And I mean, I've studied this for years, and I'm still struck. At, you know, by 1944-45, the Japanese had not managed to move on from their thinking about how war is conducted and how battle is achieved, how victory rather is achieved. Battle is a is is part of the entire component. But if you look at the British in 1944 in Fallon Hima and in Burma in 1945, battles were won because the logistics war had been won. And of the 1.3 million men in Southeast Asia Command in 1945, only 606,000 of them were in the fighting forces. And by the time the, the 4th Indian Corps had got down to Rangoon, you were talking about a, a force of maybe twenty five to thirty thousand men out of that one point three million it's understanding logistics it's understanding supply it's understanding how you actually use force at the pertinent point and at the right point to defeat the enemy that's important, not the fact that you engage in a chivalric display of force on force, which is something that slim always laughed at. you don't want to do that, and yet the Japanese always did. So the Japanese were defeated certainly by a re-energized Indian army and British army in 1944. They were defeated by far superior logistics. They were defeated by far superior military brain. There's no doubt about that. The Japanese command capabilities were deeply dysfunctional during the war. They were also defeated by the inability of the Japanese to think strategically about what they were doing. And that, that's ultimately how wars are won or lost. And that's one of the attractions to me of studying the Burma campaign, is just to see it at a, at a grand strategic and a strategic level, how the Japanese were far outthought as well as being outthought. How was it reported in Britain? Because it's, all, it's happening. There's a lot going on in the world as this is all playing out. Well, it's very interesting, actually. The, the 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 boys in the Far East always called themselves the Forgotten Army that started in 1942. Uh, it was because, you know, newspapers took six weeks to get out to the Far East. And whenever they came out, they'd be full of stories about the war in the Mediterranean and Italy and, and so on. And uh, this is 1943. And then, and of course, in Northwest Europe, 1944. And there was very little out there about themselves. And um, they felt a long way. The Brits certainly felt a long way from home. But of course, that was a, a result of the Germany First policy, where uh, the, during the Atlantic Agreement in mid 1941, Roosevelt and Churchill agreed that in the event of the two sides coming together, Germany would be um, would be the primary focus of their efforts, and the Far East. I mean, Admiral King and the Pacific had a different idea, but ultimately it was Germany First, which meant that in the Far East, the 14th Army were, got everything last, and we don't have time now to, to, to describe that, but. In, in one of Slim's great triumphs was that he recognised that the, the the morale of the fighting man was absolutely key. The man, each fighting man, Indian or Briton or African, needed to understand what they were fighting for, how they had to fight it, how they would be successful. To the point that you know, hundreds of British veterans I have interviewed over the years have all said, "We knew that we were at the bottom of the supply chain, and we had to make it work." Uh, just to give you an idea of the scale of this, Slim knew that in order to cross the Chindwin and then the Irrawaddy, he would need boats. He would need 550 of them. He would, knew that he would need to have boats that were strong enough to carry Sherman and Lee Grant tanks. So they needed to, they needed to be able to carry sort of 10, they needed to be 10 tons in weight. Now, how do you create 550 10 ton uh, boats to cross the Chindwin? You make them. And in 1943 and in 1943, early 44, the 14th Army chopped down teak forests and built 550 boats to cross the Chinon and Irrawaddy. That was known as the Irrawaddy Flotilla. 
quite an extraordinary story of um, just make do and mend. You know, he knew that he wasn't going to get the boats from anywhere else. No, it just wouldn't happen. He had to deliver it himself. And he did so dramatically successfully. It's really quite an extraordinary story. You know, the fighting is only part of it, in my view. The amazing efforts to conquer the, the tyrannies of distance and of geography are the most amazing things, in my view, about the Burma campaign. Your listeners have heard me describe the distance between Calcutta and Dimapur, 800 miles. Well, by 1945, the journey from Calcutta to Dimapur, across the hills to Manipur, across the additional hills to, to Tamu on the Chinwen, and then to Mandalay, and then all the way down to Rangoon, was 1,800 miles, so another 1,000 miles. Well, you can argue that the battle around um, Rangoon in March, April, May 1945 was being fought from Calcutta. Now, that's the same distance as from London to Moscow. So there we are. Get your head around the size and scale of this absolutely extraordinary campaign. The equivalent of fighting a war in Moscow with your troops in Moscow, your four troops in Moscow, and your brain is in London. Now, that's amazing. Absolutely incredible. Is it? You, you forget. It's easy to think that the the the, the Jack campaign against the Japanese. You, you easily think of the Pacific being an enormous size, but not necessarily the Burma campaign. The Burma campaign was a campaign at the very end of a very very long pencil. It's quite extraordinary even to think about it. Well, I've talked about the Fourth Indian Corps rushing down to Rangoon um, in April and uh, very early May, nineteen forty-five. Ninety percent of all their fuel in the tanks. Were, was flown in by C-47. So the, the engineers would leap forward, create an airfield under enemy fire. The aircraft would land, roll out the 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 forty four no the um the uh, drums of fuel. Aircraft being pocketed with machine gun fire, they would fly out. And the, the tanks would then refuel on that and drive on down to Tungu. Just a, quite an extraordinary effort and story. And, you know, the men were on half rations by that stage. They knew that victory was in their side. So, you know, Mandalay to Rangoon is the same distance as London to Marseille. And that campaign took six weeks. Uh, just the most amazingly innovative and dramatic campaign, I think, in one of the most dramatic campaigns in military history, completely ignored by, by the world and by history, because, of course, this war was being fought after VE Day. And, well, actually, that's not entirely true of me. It's 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 certainly been fought way after D Day, and where the world's attention has been uh, been focused on Northwest Europe and not not on the Far East. This was a war that just happened almost on the historic periphery. That doesn't mean that it wasn't important. I de- absolutely do not hold to the Max Hastings argument that it was a sideshow and wasn't wasn't important at all. It was critically important in defeating the Japanese. It was critically important in creating a sense in India of its own greatness as a civil society and uh, of, a, of a, having a capable army of doing so, a truly national army for the first time in India. And um, the Japanese needs to be defeated on land. It's very interesting. I did a, a documentary in Japan. In fact, they came out to interview me in the UK as well for um, NHTV, the Japanese equivalent of the BBC. Uh, in 2018. And uh, one of the most amazing things that uh, struck me there was that when you go to Japan, you talk about the Second World War, it's very rare to hear anyone talk about Iwo Jima or Guadalcanal or Palalu or Okinawa. They're not the battles that the Japanese remember. The Japanese tend to remember the battles where their armies were defeated in the field. And there were three armies defeated, uh, three Japanese armies defeated in the field in the Second World War in addition to the garrisons that were destroyed by the American Marines and the army during the island hopping campaign. The three Japanese armies that were defeated in the field, the first was the 15th Army defeated at Imphal and Kahima. The second was the Japanese army under General Kimura defeated at the Battle of the Irrawaddy Shore around Mactila and Mandalay in 1945. And the third Japanese army that was defeated in the Second World War was defeated in Manchuria by the the Soviet general, General Zhukov. I was absolutely flabbergasted when I was talking to people. They talk about the infile operation. When they think about their defeat in the Second World War, they think about the infile operation, which, of course, includes Gehima. Uh, and it was a number of years of interviewing Japanese veterans and thinking about this that um, made me realize this. Final point is that one of my first Japanese veterans was a wonderful Japanese man 
the 29th division called a 29th regiment called Masao Hirakubu. And I had lunch with Masao. Masao was a long resident in the United Kingdom, died many years ago. But Masao uh, and I were having his favorite food was pasta, and we were having uh, pasta in a haymarket one night. And I said to him, I made the mistake of saying, Now, Masao, when you were defeated at Kahima, and he stomped his hand down and on the table and said, we were never defeated. We were forced to withdraw because we had run out of food and ammunition. Now, in my view, that's defeat, but not in the Japanese view. And I've never, ever forgotten. Masao was a very impressive man. He was actually awarded an OBE by the Queen for his uh, work in reconciliation between Britain and Japan after the war. Uh, unusual because he was a Japanese Christian and never saw the point of the war, but still, still had this Japanese pension for battle and for fighting and never ever believed that the Japanese had been defeated at Kahima. When I first went to Japan in 2000, I was interviewing Japanese veterans. They all had the feud. They had never been defeated. They'd been let down. There was a lot of the stab in the back stuff. They recognized that they'd been defeated by an enormous, uh, the enormous industrial might of the West, but they still believed that they were in the right. Mm, well, Robert, let's let's leave it there. As I, as I said before you started, I really enjoyed your book. Thank you. Well, listener, if you want to know about the campaigns of India and Burma, I can highly recommend A War of Empires, Japan, India, Burma and Britain, 1941-45. I will put a link on the website. Don't forget, you can support the podcast at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. I do make available extras for patrons of the show. And I'm about to ask Robert about Ord Wingate and the Chindits, which I will make available exclusively to patrons. So to sign up, go to patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Well, that is all for me for now. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening. Eighty-eight millimeter gun hit our tongue, blew us the hell out of it. The hell out of it. The hell out of it. Stalingrad can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander in Chief, I have granted a military armistice.